Good morning. I love walking in and there's so much fellowship going on. That means we're spreading the joy, right? Spreading the love. That's great. Um, Well, what a great day it is to be in the Lord's house today. And I hope and pray that everybody is here and that you are ready with open hearts and open minds to what the Holy Spirit wants to tell us today. And so I hope that we um, can be receptive to whatever... Um, we are we are taught today and so this morning as we come together it is such a joy to know that our savior is risen he is alive today and we have such a message to tell to this world and so this morning we're going to sing about that risen savior that came as a bra- as a newborn baby to our earth to send us salvation so let's all stand together this morning as we begin with go tell it on the mountain that he wants us to tell the world the good news of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. All right, so here's what I want you to do. There's a lot of people here this morning. So I want you to look to your neighbor. I want you to shake their hand, tell them they're pretty, tell them that you are glad that they are here this morning. All right, all right. We're glad to see you here this morning. I saw a lot of husbands tell their wives that they were pretty, probably the first time in a while, so you're welcome, wives. You're very welcome, men. You're welcome also, because it may, may benefit you as well, but we are glad that you are here this morning. As we continue to get closer to Christmas and remember the reason for the season, I'm glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. If you look at your bulletin, there's a couple of dates and announcements that I want you to look at. So tonight will be our Christmas ministry night. It'll start at 5 o'clock in the FLC. We'll have some snacks. We'll sing some Christmas carols. And we'll be doing some missions also. So Angel Tree gifts are due today also. And those can be left on a designated table in the FLC. Or they can be brought tonight. Be sure that these gifts are unwrapped. And they are labeled with the angel number. We'll be wrapping some gifts. We'll be packing some grocery boxes. If you have not been in the FLC, there's about... $1,800 $1,800 worth of food from Walmart in there that we are getting to send out into the community. So thank you for giving to Angel Tree. I know that those food boxes are going to bless so many families that are struggling over the holidays. So thank you for doing that. 
And Leslie Randall also mentioned that if you have any extra holiday gift bags that you have, would you please bring those tonight because we will need them. Uh, this Wednesday, December 15th, we'll have our children and youth Christmas party, so be sure to bring your students and your kids for that. Students, the theme is Lumberjack. So be sure to wear your favorite flannel. We'll be throwing some axes, doing a lot of dangerous stuff. Not really, I'm just kidding, don't worry. Uh, we'll be throwing some plungers, pretend they're axes. It'll be, for, it'll be a lot of fun. So be sure to be a part of that. Uh, next Sunday, December 19th, there will be no Sunday school. And we'll have our Christmas musical here um, during the service hour. December 22nd, that's not this Wednesday, but the next, we'll have no midweek activities. December 24th, we'll have our uh, Christmas Eve candlelight service. At 5 p.m. and on December 26th, we will also not have Sunday school. So on the next Sunday, January 2nd, we'll resume to normal activities. We'll have Sunday school worship at the same time. Uh, uh, I know a few of you have heard about the, the family that suffered from a fire the past couple of days, and we actually are taking up an offering for them. They lost a bunch of clothes and stuff due to water damage from the fire. So if you feel led to, to give to that family, there's a designated box in the foyer that you can, that you can give to. All that money will go to them. The GAs and the RAs will be making fruit baskets this Wednesday. They'll be done uh, after service Wednesday. So if you would like to deliver some of those, you can pick those up and deliver them. And uh, Jacob and I, Jacob is not here this morning. He's visiting some family. But we have been asked to bring items to Kenya. They have given us a 50-pound suitcase that we can take to Kenya that we can fill up with all kind of items that they have asked us to bring. And some of those items are cooking spices like salt, pepper, oregano, that kind of stuff, uh, kitchen gloves, serving gloves, uh, kids' allergy meds, markers, pens, pencils, Christmas items like decorations, ornaments, that kind of stuff, pudding and jello cups, and deodorant. So if you would like to help, help donate to that, there is a designated bin in the foyer that you can put those things in, that we get to take those to the kids at the orphanage in Kenya. So I hope that you will uh, consider giving those so that we can take them to Kenya. I know that was a lot of announcements. I hope I didn't miss anything. We have a lot going on. It's a busy time of year, and I'm glad that you're here so that we can just slow down for a minute, we can take a deep breath, and we can remember the reason for the season. And I want to pray this morning as we get started. Father, thank you for today. Lord, as I just mentioned, it's a busy time of year, but I'm glad that we get to come here this morning and just, just slow down and just remember why we're even celebrating. We can get caught up in the food and the gifts and the decorations, but Lord, I pray that we don't, we don't miss the birth of our Savior. Lord, that is, that's the reason. And I pray that we can reflect on that today, that when we sing today, that we can, we can lift your name high, that we can understand these lyrics and think about them and, and meditate on them and just think about your goodness and your grace and how even though we're lost and dead in our sin, Lord, you sent your only son to live a perfect life who was born in a most humble way in a manger Lord, I pray that we can just reflect on that today and that we take what we learn today to the nations and that we fulfill the Great Commission. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us when we're not always lovable people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And also, we will have a quick business meeting after service today. Guest, you will have an opportunity to leave when that starts, but just, just be aware of that. Well, this week, I know many of you had the same opportunity, but this, Wednesday, this past Wednesday night, several of us went to see the movie that was based on um, the TV series called The Chosen, and it included in it, of course, the story that just depicts um, what really happened in Bethlehem and how Jesus came as a, as a tiny baby um, just to be our gift. And so um, that's what it was really about, but it also included a lot of just Christmas music throughout it and even though it was it was absolutely beautiful and it just made you sit back and just worship uh, Jesus and who he really is everything that they sang everything that they spoke and I hope and pray that everything that we share at Christmas time that it all can point us back to Jesus Christ and that's what it's all about we are here to serve God but we are also here to honor and to glorify and to praise the precious, holy, unmatchable name of Jesus Christ. And so um, I hope that we can, through this Christmas season, that we don't just focus in on the songs or the, the hustle and bustle of all the things we have to go buy or the things we have to go do, but that we can just sit back and sit in awe of who Jesus Christ really is this season. 
this morning, if you would, let's all stand together as we continue. And as you stand, I want to remind you of a scripture, and it's Luke 2, 14, and it says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men.
you may be seated. I know it's always a favorite to hear it. We hear it every year, and it's always so good every year. So we appreciate you, Hope, for using your talent for the glory of God. If you have your Bibles, hope you brought those with you. Go ahead and grab them out. We are going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. We're in a series called Christmas According to the Scriptures. And today we're going to look at Christmas according to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, we're just so honored, God, to be in your house, God, to be in your presence, to be reminded, hopefully, over and over again of, God, the reason why we're here, and the reason is you, God, the reason is your love, the reason is your son, Jesus, God, that he might come out of the glory of heaven for the poverty of earth, to live the life that we were supposed to live, to die the death that we were supposed to die. God, so that if we believed in him, believed in you, God, we would receive the greatest gift, and that is eternal life. God, help us to be ever so remindful of that. And God, I pray that we would even see that in this story, God, in Isaiah chapter 9. God, I pray that it would just illuminate in our hearts and minds, God, that we would be able to apply the scripture to our lives. And God, help us just to all 
Go out and share that with others today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, if you and I were to be honest with ourselves this morning, there are some pretty unbelievable things that make up the Christian faith. Uh, for example, if you were just to take the, the Christmas story, the, the story of Christmas, right? As Christians, we believe some pretty crazy things, if you really think about it, right? As Christians, we believe uh, that a heavenly host of angels miraculously appeared to a bunch of shepherds and announced the birth of a Savior. Uh, we believe that, that a baby depicted in the manger scene, that it's not some cute, cuddly baby, but that's actually God in the flesh, Furthermore, we believe that, that three wise men followed a star from some faraway land, all so that they could come and worship this baby who is the Son of God. And we believe that Mary did not conceive this child with her husband Joseph, but rather Jesus was conceived through the mysterious power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me be clear that as your pastor, I, of course, believe those things with all of my heart. I hope that if you're a believer here today, that you would feel the same way as well. But I also want to acknowledge that for some of you here this morning, you might have a really hard time believing some of those things. Right and rightfully so. They're, they're supernatural things. In, in fact, there might be some things, whether it's the Christmas story or not, but there might be certain aspects of the Christian faith that you're just honestly skeptical about, right? Honestly, you, you struggle with, with this or that. Sometimes you maybe even wonder, is this stuff made up or is this actually real? Can it be trusted? Can it be seen as being true? And so listen, if you're in one of those categories this morning, can I just start off by saying, number one, that is completely normal. Uh, if we were to swallow our pride, I would say that for most of us in this room, at some point in our walk with Christ and in the Lord, we've had a hard time or maybe struggled with certain things in the Scriptures. I myself know that I have firsthand. And number two, because I've struggled with this before, I want to point you towards something that has always helped me, at least over the years, help affirm my faith, believe these things, to be given the confidence that the Word of God is just that. That it is the very words of God, that it is divinely inspired by Him, and that what it says can be trusted, can be seen, it's true, because the Word of God, word of God is inerrant, infallible, and without error. Do you want to know what that is for me? What, what, what that's always been for me, what I would always go back to when I struggle with, with believing certain things, or, or God, how can this, how could that have happened? I'll always go back to one thing, and if I could describe it in one word, it would be this. Prophecies. Prophecies. More specifically, I'm talking about the fulfilled prophecies that are found in God's Word. You see, in the Bible, there are a total of, get this, 1,817 prophecies found in the Word of God. If you were to do the math on that, and I did, I'm not a great math student, but I think I got this right. But if you were to do the math on that, that would be 1,239 prophecies found in the Old Testament. And then that means that there are 578 prophecies that are found in the New Testament. Comprised all together, those prophecies, listen to this, they encompass 8,000 532 verses. And by the way, there's only 31,102 verses in the entire Bible, which means on average there is some type of prophecy being spoken about, statistically speaking, every three to four verses of Scripture. That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool, right? So, so listen, there, there are over 1,200 prophecies found in the Old Testament and out of that number, there are around 322 direct prophecies about the first coming of Jesus. Now keep in mind, I'm not talking about some vague prophecy about some great man, this great teacher who healed people and, and then tragically died and then rose from death. I'm not talking about that. Okay, I, I'm talking about places like Micah 5.2. Because in Micah 5, 2, it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in the town of Bethlehem. And, and guess what? That happened. In, in Psalm twenty two sixteen, 16, it was prophesied that Jesus would be crucified by having his, his hands and his feet pierced. And that happened. 
In Psalm 22, 18, it was prophesied that the executioners would, would, uh, who killed Jesus would gamble for his clothes. And guess what? That happened in Zechariah eleven thirteen. It was prophesied that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And that happened in Daniel 9, 25. It was prophesied that Jesus would be born 173,880 days from the decree of Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem. And that happened in Isaiah 53, 9. It was prophesied that Jesus would be buried with the rich. And guess what? That happened in Psalm 16.10. It was prophesied that Jesus would, would rise from the grave. And that happened. And listen, I could keep going, but there would be 315 prophecies that I've yet to mention. So for sake of time, can we just say that the Word of God can be trusted because all of these prophecies, they have come true concerning Jesus. Now with that fresh on our minds... Prophecies, the fulfillment of prophecies. To, to, prophecies Today, I want us to look at one of those prophecies found in the Old Testament Scriptures that, that speaks about the birth of Christ, and it also predicts a type of character that he would have as king in the millennial reign. Again, the passage is found in Isaiah chapter 9, and keep in mind that this, was, this prophecy was written about seven to 800 years before Jesus was even born. Pretty amazing, right? So let me set the stage for you, okay? Let me set the stage for you as we prepare to read our text this morning. There's some background information that I want you to understand here. We're jumping into a book. There's a lot going on in this book. Let me just kind of piece all this together for you because I think it'll help you appreciate a little bit more. But as we enter into the first chapters of Isaiah, what we find is that there is a rising power in the Middle East named Assyria. And all the other nations, the smaller nations, they kind of start to get nervous. And they're nervous about how strong Assyria has become. And so these smaller nations, well, they, they form an alliance together to kind of defend themselves from those threats. And so these leaders, they, they come together and they decide that they want Jerusalem's king, that being King Ahaz, to join their alliance. But turns out King Ahaz doesn't want to have any of that because he doesn't think too highly of these leaders. And so, because of that, these leaders, well, they threaten uh, uh, Ahaz. They threaten to invade his land, invade Jerusalem. They threaten to kill him. Their plan is to basically replace him with someone they can control and manipulate. You could say a, a puppet king, right? And, and so their, their armies, they're, they're starting to make plans to invade Jerusalem. And as you can imagine, King Ahaz, well, he's panicking, right? He's, he's freaking out. What, what, what are we going to do, right? And rightfully so. But listen, the, the plot twist in, in all of this is that the king of Assyria, well, he hears about these things, and so he comes to King Ahaz and says, listen, don't join forces with them. No, instead, join forces with me, and I will in turn pre uh, protect you from these other enemies of yours. And so now King, king Ahaz, right, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Right? He, he's, he's in a pickle. He doesn't know what to do. Who to trust, who to choose, right? And so he's, again, he's panicking, he's freaking out, doesn't know what to do, what direction to go, and that's when God decides to send him the prophet Isaiah. And through Isaiah, he tells King Ahaz, stop panicking. Stop worrying, because listen, you don't have to join this side or that side or, or this evil army or that evil army. No, instead, God tells King Ahaz that he will protect him and Jerusalem from their enemies, so there's no need to worry, there's no need to panic, there's no need to be concerned, because God is on your side, and He will deliver you from your foes. Well, I wish I could tell you that King Ahaz suddenly became emboldened. I wish I could tell you that, that suddenly he became so confident in these promises that God gives him here, but, but that's not how the story goes. No, instead, King Ahaz, he's still worried. He's still nervous about the future. Apparently, Isaiah can see this all over his face. And so in an attempt to calm his nerves, Isaiah says, listen, I'll give you a sign from God to show you that what I am saying, it will become fulfilled. It will become true. But then King Ahaz interrupts him and says, don't give me a sign. I don't, I don't want a sign. For if, if, if God gives me a sign, well, that means I have to obey it. And that's a pretty scary thing to do. 
And by the way, before we move on, can we just pause? And can I just point out that a lot of times we're guilty of having that exact same response as well, aren't we? Like King Ahaz, we don't want a sign from God because that means we have to obey it. And that explains why so many of us don't spend time in God's Word. That explains why so many of us don't share the gospel with our friends. That explains why so many of us run from God. Because we know that that seeing Him and receiving a sign from Him, it leads to one thing in our life, and that is obedience. And so many of us were scared about making that type of commitment in our lives. But now going back to this story in Isaiah, King Ahaz does not want a son. Does not want a son, right? Does not want to necessarily obey God. But Isaiah says, listen, buddy, I'm going to give you one anyway. You don't want one? Well, I'm going to give you one. And the sign can be found in Isaiah 7, 14. I know we looked at, we're looking at Isaiah 9, but Isaiah 7, 14, very famous, says this. A virgin will give birth to a child. A child. But, but King Ahaz is like, a child? Really? I don't need a child right now. I need a solution to my problem. In other words, God, I don't need a sign. I need deliverance. And in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah gives King Ahaz a prophecy that would ultimately fulfill those very things. But it would be through a birth of a child. Look with me now at what Isaiah says there, beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 9. He says, nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice with when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod of their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. Now look at verse 6 and 7. This is the famous passage that we read this time of year. For a child will be born for us. This is the prophecy. A son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Now, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, King Ahaz ends up rejecting all of this advice all of this counsel, all of these signs that God had given him through the prophet Isaiah. Not only that, he ends up making an alliance with Assyria, which does not help him. Actually, it backfires. Assyria comes against him, wants to take them over. And then to make matters worse, King Ahaz completely loses it and goes off the rails. And he starts sacrificing to other gods from the surrounding nations. But this only takes he and Israel down a path of idolatry, which ultimately leads to their exile and destruction. Now question, why am I, why am I telling you all of this? Right? Why give you so much detailed information about this king named Ahaz? Well, what I want you to understand is that King Ahaz failed the people of God. And this is something we see time and time and time again all throughout the story of Israel. For example, the Bible tells us that, that Israel, they wanted a king. They wanted, they longed for someone to lead them. And so they end up getting Saul, who was an absolute train wreck. An absolute train wreck. Later, they, they end up getting David, and he's pretty good, right? But turns out David's a murderer and an adulterer. And Ahaz? Ahaz, really? Well, we've seen he can't make a decision for the life of him. We've seen that ultimately he turns his back on God. And resorts to things like idolatry. Right? In, in other words, every king that Israel ever had, everyone they ever had, it, it, they ended up letting them down. Period. One after the other, they came and they rose. But one thing that was consistent was that they failed the people of God in some way. But you see, what Isaiah does here is, is he points the people to a king that would never fail them. Now, this king would be a better king, 
This king would be a, a true king. This king would be a king that ruled his people with great love, affection, and counsel. This king would be the king that Israel and all of humanity had been waiting for, had been longing for. This king would come in the form of a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. For this king would be the son of God, the son of man, God in the flesh, would be given the name that is above every name, which is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Church family, today I want to remind you that like King Ahaz, all of us have problems. All of us have problems. All of us have flaws, deficiencies, things we wish were different, but they're not. For example, some of you here this morning, you you have health problems. Some of you have, have relationship problems. Some of you have problems with your kids. Some of you have problems with your spouse. Some of you have problems with anxiety and depression and and addiction. And all of us have one problem in common, and that is sin. So listen, whatever the case may be, you fill in the blank. The reality is that every single one of us in this room has some type of problem. And I'd be willing to bet that for most of you, you feel absolutely overwhelmed by it just as King Ahaz did with his problems. In other words, just like King Ahaz, you and I have an enemy that is larger than us. And we really need God to step up and help us. And so through this passage, what I want to show you is that we don't find the answer to our problems in ourselves or others like Ahaz did. But rather, through King Jesus, we have a solution to our problems, and he gives us two things, help for the now and hope for the future. See, it's those two things, two things that this passage of Scripture, I believe, really highlights in Isaiah chapter 9. Through Jesus, we are given help for the now, that being our present day problem, that being our present day situations, living in a fallen world. We, We received some level of help from Jesus, But now also through Jesus, we're we're given another thing. We're given hope for the future. Because ultimately, when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom, all of our problems will disappear, never to be seen again. And we should long for those things, that hope. All right, so let's unpack those two principles. That's what I want to do. Unpack those two principles based upon this passage. Let's start by looking at how this passage points to Jesus giving us help for the now, which again represents the problems that we are faced with in our life today. You see, in in verse 6, we are given an amazing description of who Jesus is, the type of king he would be. Again, notice what it says there in verse 6. It says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now what I want you to notice here are the relational names given to Jesus at the end of this verse. See those those four relational names? For example, the first descriptive name given to Jesus is that He is a Wonderful Counselor. We have a wonderful counselor in Jesus. Listen, that's wonderful news for us because we have a wondrous amount of problems and we need a wonderful Savior to help us with them. And you see, that's what we get in Jesus. We we, we get those things. He truly is wonderful in that he is wonderfully conceived in the womb of a virgin. He wonderfully demonstrated his power to heal. He he wonderfully taught the scriptures like no one ever had before him or has since. He wonderfully lived a perfect life. He wonderfully died on the cross for our sins. Wonderfully rose from the grave to defeat death and the enemy forevermore. And I don't know about you, but I think that is a wonderful description of who Jesus is. But not only that, he is a wonderful counselor, a wonderful counselor in that he gives guidance to his people, in that he gives wisdom to his people, in that he gives leadership to his people, he gives counsel to his people because he is a wonderful and all-perfect king. 
Church, this Christmas season, we need to realize, we need to realize that through the birth of Christ, we are promised a King, a Savior who will help us with our problems in the now. In the now. And listen, that's not to say that you're not going to have problems in this life because you will have problems. You will. But through the leadership of Jesus, we're given a wonderful counselor who will guide us through our problems, ultimately will give us all the things we need to overcome our problems until he returns again. Number two, the second descriptive name that we are shown here is that he is a mighty God. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Again, that is good news for you and me because we have a mighty enemy, don't we? Mighty enemy who is Satan. We have a mighty amount of problems. Who does? I know I do. Mighty enemy, mighty amount of problems ultimately do again to the sin in our lives. Listen, we have a mighty enemy that the Bible says wants to destroy us, wishes to devour us for the sin in our lives. So we need a mighty Savior to deliver us from those things. And again, that is found in this prophecy, the person of Jesus Christ, who is going to be God in the flesh, as is foretold in the Scriptures. Listen, Jesus, Jesus is so mighty. He's so mighty. For example, was it not Jesus... Was it not Jesus who created the world before he physically entered into it? As is spoken about in the scriptures such as John 1.3 and Colossians 1.16. Was it not Jesus who who calmed the wind and the waves as is spoken about in Mark 4? Was it not Jesus who showed us he has power over disease in Matthew 9. He has power over demonic forces in Luke 8. He even has power over death, which is spoken about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, church, in Jesus, we have, say it with me, a mighty God. A mighty God. And listen, please don't miss the fact that he's not just mighty and that he has power over all creations. Certainly he does, but also because we are his people, he is the source of our power through the gift of the Holy Spirit. He is the strength of our lives when we feel weak, overwhelmed, and afraid. And he secures our eternity. As 1 Peter chapter 1 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for each and every single one of you if you so believe in Him. We have a mighty God. We have a wonderful Counselor. Those things help us in the now. Thirdly, we have this name, Everlasting Father. Jesus is our Everlasting Father. Listen, this is not to be confused with God being our Father, which is the doctrine of the Trinity, but rather what this speaks to and points to is Jesus protecting and providing for the children of God just as a father does. And ultimately, it points to Jesus acting as our Father during His millennial reign as King, which we're going to talk to more in a moment. Listen, for now, what I want you to see, what I want you to see is that in Jesus, we have an everlasting Father who provides and protects us through the cross. And listen, he, he, He's given us a gift that no earthly dad could ever give their child as much as they might want to. And that is perfect love, perfect acceptance. Ultimately, it's eternal life. See, the reason I bring that out to you this morning is because the reality is that whether or not you have a good relationship with your dad or or maybe you didn't I don't know the reality is that no earthly father is perfect and they're going to make mistakes along the way they're going to sin against you in fact I realize that for some of you here today your relationship with your earthly father has caused you as a result to view your relationship with your heavenly father in a negative way. For example, growing up, maybe your father was the never satisfied dad. Your dad, the never satisfied dad. What a great way just to, to sum up that life because you felt like no matter what you did, it was just never enough for him. Never good enough, right? 
And so whether he meant to or, or not, you always had this feeling in your gut that in order to earn his acceptance, in order to earn his love, you had to perform. You had to do something that would win him over. And instinctively, maybe that's caused you to doubt and wonder if your heavenly father feels the same way. That in some sense, you, you have to earn his acceptance for him to actually love you as his child. For others of you, maybe your father was, was, was not that. Maybe your father was the time bomb dad. Your dad growing up, time bomb dad. Maybe he had a bad day at work, and he regularly took that out on you. Maybe he, he just always seemed to have a, a short temper, was just irritable, never seemed to be happy. Your memories of your dad, were, they just weren't happy memories. He didn't seem very happy around you. And maybe that's what's caused you to be a little afraid of your dad. You were scared of what he would do, right? And, and so you walked on eggshells around him. And maybe, just maybe, that same type of view has bled over to how you view your relationship with your heavenly father as well. Or maybe still for others of you, maybe your father was the emotionally distant dad. The emotionally distant dad. And in other words, it wasn't that he wasn't stable or, or consistent and moral. It was just that he never seemed to express any sort of emotion or affection towards you. Maybe growing up, you, you never once heard him say, or at least rarely say these words, I love you. I'm proud of you. You're good at this. You're good at that. And because of those things, maybe you've applied that same type of view towards your relationship with your Heavenly Father, and you see him as being distant, emotionless, detached from the intricacies of your life. And lastly, maybe your dad was the absent dad growing up. The absent dad. Of course, this refers to the dad who walked out on you, as is the case, statistically speaking, for 40% of Americans today. But this can also apply to the dad that never left his family, not necessarily, but he just was never home. Never home because he was doing this or that or all the responsibilities at work kept him there and not with you. And so maybe as a result of, of having your father who was one of these things in your life, it has, as a result calls you to have a cold view towards your heavenly father. But again, can I just remind you that in Christ, we have a heavenly father who is everlasting and he embodies none of those things that I just mentioned. No one said in his love for you and I, he perfectly provides and protects us. And get this, we don't have to earn that over time. Nowhere in Scripture does it say we have to earn those things. No, all it says is that we, all we have to do is believe in Him and we are promised, granted, these things in full. In other words, to go back to that illustration I just used to describe sometimes our earthly fathers and their faults and flaws. Jesus, who is your perfect heavenly Father, He accepts you fully as you are rather than being never satisfied in who you are. Jesus is slow to anger and full of his steadfast love rather than being a time bomb that you feel like you have to walk on eggshells around. Jesus is emotionally engaged in you rather than being emotionally distant from you. Jesus pr promises to be ever present in our life rather than abandoning our life, never being present in it. We have an everlasting Father. Church, do you see this? We have so much help for the now, Jesus has given us so much help. He's our wonderful counselor. He's our, he's our mighty God. He's our everlasting Father. And lastly, He is our Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. That's the last descriptive name we see in that verse, isn't it? That He is a Prince of Peace. Jesus is, listen, a Prince of Peace in three main ways. The way I see it, three main ways. Number one, number one He is our Prince of Peace in that He restores our broken relationship with God. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Jesus made us alive. Jesus restored our relationship with God, so He restores broken things. He gives us peace in that way. Number two, He is our Prince of Peace, in that He brings peace and harmony into our lives, again, in the now. The Bible says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, that if we feel burdened, if we feel weary, He's going to give us rest. It says also elsewhere that if we feel troubled, we can cast our cares on Him, and He can give that peace in our lives. 
And number three, he's our Prince of Peace in that he assures our final destiny, right? By giving us the gift of eternal life and being with him and the Father in heaven when this life and earth passes away. And you see, it is in this truth, this truth that we find the second implication of the prophecy foretold in Isaiah. Because you see, while we have help for the now in all these many different ways that hopefully I've been able to show you, we also have hope for the future. Hope for the future, and that again is found in Jesus as well. For example, the scriptures tell us in Isaiah chapter 9 that when Jesus returns again, he's going to establish his kingdom. This is the millennial reign. Right? As king, the first part of verse 6 tells us that the government will be on his shoulders. That's, that means the weight of the world is going to be placed solely upon him. And verse 7 goes on to tell us that, that his dominion, it's going to be vast. His prosperity is never going to end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness. From now on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish these things. In other words, when Jesus first came down to earth, his mission was to deal with our sins. But when Jesus returns again, he will restore justice and peace on this earth. Let me put it to you like this. The first advent brought us relief from our sins and help for the now. But the second, the, the second coming advent will bring us full relief from our suffering, and that provides us hope for the future. And so this Christmas season, my, my hope and prayer for each and every single one of you is not just to celebrate this first coming of Christ through His birth. Certainly, I want you to do that. But through texts like these, I also want us to see that we should be celebrating the promise of His return. He's going to come again. He's going to establish His kingdom. It's going to be filled with justice and righteousness. That's worth celebrating. In other words, while we should celebrate Jesus for the help He's given us now through His birth, life, death, and resurrection, may we also worship and long for His return as we will be under His leadership, His authority, and will live in a kingdom that will prosper and never end. And so this Christmas, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the fact that part of this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, well, it has come true. For indeed... Indeed, a child has been born to us. Indeed, a son has been given for you and I. Indeed, he is a wonderful counselor. He is a mighty God. He is an everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. But may we too, may we too long for the final and ultimate fulfillment of what this actually really even points to. And that is his coming kingdom. For indeed, when he returns again, the government will be on his shoulders. Indeed, when he returns again, his dominion it will, it will be vast. Prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. And I don't know about you, but I think that is worth celebrating this Christmas season. Let's pray as we close. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your son. God, I pray that in everything that I do and everything that's done on the stage, God, that everything that's done in this church, in our lives, each and every one of our lives, God, that it would point towards you. God, ultimately that it would point towards your love for us. That you would send your one and only Son, God, down to this earth to dwell among us to be among us, God, to, to give us the help that we so desperately need. God, I pray in, in this passage we've seen that you, your son, Jesus, it's the ultimate king in our lives. God, we don't have to look at this person or that person. God, we don't have to find this ourselves. How do we navigate this or that? God, in Jesus we have those things in full. He is our wonderful counselor. He is our mighty God. He is our everlasting Father. He is our Prince of Peace. God, I pray this Christmas season God, that we would just embrace that. We have help for the now, and not only do we have help for the now, we have hope. We have hope this Christmas season for the future. God, I know it can be sometimes depressing 
turn on the TV and to see what's going on in this world, but God, your word tells us that you're coming again. And when you come again, the government will not be on this person's shoulders or that person's shoulders. No, it'll be upon your son's shoulders. And in this kingdom, there will not be any wars or division or hostility or sin. No, in this kingdom, it'll be perfect. You'll provide peace and righteousness. So God, may we embrace in that as well. God, we love you and we thank you. And God, I pray that we would just dwell upon these promises, these prophecies this morning as we sing in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? The song this morning as we close to respond to and reflect on is, O Come to the Altar. I know it's a song you know well. And for maybe some of you here this morning, that's exactly what you need to do. You need to come down to the altar. Because maybe you've, maybe you've tried to be the ruler of your life. Maybe you've been kind of like King Ahaz and you've been trying to find everything in yourself or, or someone else. And maybe this morning you've just been reminded that you don't find the, the help in the now in you or, or, or some other person. No, you find it squarely in Jesus. And so maybe this morning you just need to give that over to him and say, God, I'm coming to you acknowledging that I cannot do it on my own. But I'm also acknowledging through your word that you give me the help that I need right now. That if I invite you into my life, if I trust in you, then you will be my wonderful counselor. You will be my mighty God and everlasting father and prince of peace. For others of you, maybe who who have dealt with some other type of thing, maybe you just need to come down and pray. You want to do that right here at this altar. Again, this is the time for you to do that. If you need to talk to someone, I'll be down here. Any other response you need to make, I pray that you would do so right now in these next few minutes as we sing this song together. being here and being a part of our services today. I hope you've enjoyed 
your time here today in Sunday school and obviously together here in the sanctuary. I hope you've been reminded of just why we do what we do. Hopefully we don't just think about that in December, but each and every day out of the year as believers, we have so much to be thankful for and celebrate. And so I want to just remind you of that. I want to remind you that we are also going to have a quick business meeting after I pray. Guests, we want to thank you for being here and we're so glad that you're here. But if you'd like to exit out, uh, after I pray, there will be a time for you to do that. And so just keep that in mind. And then lastly, just one last reminder. Um, I do want to remind you about our service opportunity tonight. Uh, I know Hunter alluded to it, but there is a lot um, out there in the FLC that we need to put together and do. And honestly, what better way to spend your Sunday afternoon than to do that? Tell me one thing that would be better than to serve someone. Uh, I don't think that you're going to be able to find that. So we would love for you to be a part of that. It's going to start at 5 going to have some food and drink, I'm going to sing some songs, but mostly it's going to be geared towards serving others. So be a part of that for the whole family. And I am going to pray. Uh, guess you can leave after I pray, and then we will enter into a time of business. Father, again, we're just thankful for what you're doing here at Fredonia Baptist Church. God, we have so much to be thankful for. God, ultimately, it's found in your son, Jesus. And God, we celebrate him this morning as we do, hopefully, each and every day. God, may we exalt you in what we do and what we say and how we act and respond. And God, I pray as we leave here in a moment, God, that you would lead God and direct our life as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.